Do you have a voice for radio or podcasting? I don't even know what that accent was. But today we're going to be talking with Maddie Dalrymple, the host of the Indie Author Podcast and author of Podcasting for Authors, all about whether or not you should start a podcast. Stay tuned. Hi, I'm MK Williams. I'm an author and independent publisher. I love sharing my insights about all things self-publishing with you. Before I get into the details about today's interview, don't forget to hit subscribe. That way you can be here every week as I bring you new videos about self-publishing, making a career being an author, and now being a mompreneur. Today, we're talking with Maddie Dalrymple, um, the host of the Indie Author Podcast. I've been lucky enough to actually be a guest on her podcast several times. We connected back in 2020, um, and we've kept a really good rapport going. She has really amazing um, mystery novels as well that she writes on her fiction side. But on her nonfiction side, she has books for authors like The Short Tack, talking about short fiction, um, or writing short fiction, as well as podcasting for authors. So today we're going to be talking about creating a content platform, creating her podcast, creating a YouTube channel, and whether that's something that you should explore as an author um, for some content marketing for your book. So without any further delay, here's the interview. Hi, I'm so happy to welcome Maddie Dalrymple to the channel today. I have had the honor of being on Maddie's podcast several times. Um, She hosts the Indie Author Podcast, and I'm really excited to talk with her today about podcasting. She has great nonfiction books out about podcasting and writing short fiction, which is something I'm obviously very interested in. And she also has um, under her uh, fiction titles, a series of mysteries with Anne Kinnear. So I'm super excited to have you on the channel today. Thank you. This is so exciting to be here. I always enjoy talking to you, MK. Yeah, it's it's fun because we we chat pretty regularly. Um, yeah. We usually just kind of like talk shop, but it's kind of nice to change our conversation a little bit. I guess we can't meander too much um, to be able to, <laughs> to help other authors who are thinking about starting a podcast. So I guess I'll just dive right in and say, you know, why did you decide to start podcasting? Yeah, well, I started the Indie Author Podcast back in 2016. And it was really an excuse for me to, uh, as someone who was pretty early in their author career, I published my first Dan Kinnear suspense novel in 2013. And I really just wanted an excuse to talk to the other people in my local writers group about the things that they were expert in. So there was a guy named Tony Conaway, who was like the go-to guy for tips about doing author readings. There was a guy named Scott Pruden, who had, was publishing his fiction through sort of a small cooperative imprint. Uh, There was a guy named Bruce Mowday who uh, had had a newspaper background in the area. And so he was an expert in knowing how to reach out to media to get word out about a book. And I just wanted an excuse to talk to them. So I would schedule time, I would talk to them. And almost as a courtesy, as a payback to them for spending the time with me, I would make that recording, that episode available to basically other members of the local writers group if they wanted to listen to it. And then as my as the podcast became more formalized, more professional, and more backlist available, I was able to expand my reach to other guests and expand my audience based on that. And then when I switched from doing interviews in person to doing uh, interviews virtually, then that obviously expanded the possible guest list to everybody in the whole world. So uh, yeah, it really started out as a learning and paying it forward kind of effort. And then in 2019, when I left my corporate job and I started writing and publishing and podcasting full time, then I started looking at it as being potentially an income earner as well as one of multiple streams of income, as our friend Joanna Penn likes to say. Yeah, awesome. That's uh, it's good to know the genesis of the podcast because I do think a lot of authors hear, okay, well, I should I need to have a content platform. I need to be uh, doing content marketing somehow, whether it's on YouTube or a podcast or somewhere. And so I think a lot of them go in to creating a podcast or a channel thinking, well, I just need this to help me make money versus, which can be helpful, but I'm glad to hear that you did it because of the wanting to talk to people and like pick their brains. Cause like, that's, I think the most genuine reason to do it. And then regardless of the income or not, you're still reaching that primary goal, right? Which was to talk with people and learn from them. Um, and so yeah, I, think I don't, that's, that's awesome. I don't think that there's a right or wrong way to go into, to want to go into a podcast. There's just things that are more or less aligned with expectations and reality. And so certainly starting something up immediately thinking it's going to be a money maker. In ex- my experience is not the case. And I have to turn it around and say the same question kind of applies to you and your YouTube channel. 
You want to talk mm -hmm. a little bit about what made you decide to kick off your YouTube channel? Yeah. So I had self-published my first book in 2015 and I had self-published a second in 2016. Um, and I had I had no audience. So I mean, I was just putting it out on on Facebook and on social media, like, I have a book, I have a book. Um, and I would get friends of friends or like old classmates who had a cousin who had a friend who wanted to write a book. And they would, you know, ask me questions like, well, how do I self-publish? How do I get started? And I had just solved it all out with Google and trial and error and making mistakes and then figuring out for the second one, oh, do it differently this time. Um, and I was just getting so many questions. I was like, there has to be an easier way because it was cutting into my precious free time to write. But I didn't want to just necessarily have these pre-scripted emails where I didn't feel like I was really answering that person, you know, and it was just not personalized. And so I was spending all my time rewriting it to personalize it. So that didn't help. And then I thought, oh, this is what I should do. I should record myself on a video because it feels more personal, even though I'm saying the same thing to everybody. It feels the same uh, or feels more personal. So I started my YouTube channel based on answering these questions. It's like super short, like, how do I get my book published? Where do I start with self-publishing? Do I need an ISBN? Just these really short videos. Um, and I think in the back of my mind, I said, oh, well, I know people make money on YouTube, so this will be fine. And it took me um, like two and a half years to get monetized. But it, it answered yeah. the initial need, which was when people asked me questions, I was like, just check out my YouTube channel. Just check out my YouTube channel. It's all there. Give me time to write. Yeah, um, I think it's another good example of you, as you had said, not starting out with a money motivator first and foremost, mm -hmm. uh, probably paves the way to at least less heartache. Less heartache. But then I did get to the point where it was well, creating the videos. I'm sure for you, it was the same, like creating the podcast was taking up the writing time. And so yeah. eventually you have to decide, well, if it's not going to make me or at least earn me back the time I put into it, then it has to go. So 2020 came around and I found out I was pregnant and I said, I'm going to have a lot less free time. Um, so I needed to to justify the time I was spending on YouTube by finally reaching monetization. And so I was glad that I did. I finally just learned how to optimize YouTube. Because um, when I started out, I, I didn't care about learning how to use tags and keywords. I was just like, okay, here's the answer. Um, and so just by optimizing and doing those things, that really helped. So when, when it had to be financially prudent. Um, I very quickly learned. <laughs> yeah. And so for your podcast, like if you were starting all over again today, would you do it the same way? Would you do it differently? So for any authors thinking of starting a podcast, what would be that first starting point that you would point them to? Well, this answer has sort of evolved over time. So if you had asked me this, well, if you had asked me this the day before yesterday, <laughs> almost literally, and I say this in my book, the, the Indie Author's Guide to Podcasting for Authors. One piece of advice that I wish I had followed, that I'd given myself and I wish I had followed is start simple. So actually, I did start simple. I mean, at the beginning, it was very basic. But then later on, I got a tool, the script, that enabled me to create uh, transcripts from the audio and video of the recorded Zoom meeting. And so I thought, oh, this is going to be great. You know, it's going to be a nice resource for my listeners. It'll be good for driving uh, SEO traffic to my website. Um, and so I started doing transcripts. And the transcripts were very time consuming to do. So Descript would provide an automated transcript that was, I don't know, 80% accurate. And then I was having to go through and do the editing to make it, you know, like 100% accurate. And it was taking me probably, I mean, early on, I remember it taking me eight hours to edit one hour of podcast video. And then I got, the tool got better, the, the transcription service got better, and I got better. So maybe it was only four hours, you know, it was really time consuming. And I got to a point where I start, I hired somebody to do it, which was great from a time savings point of view, but now I was shelling out an hourly rate for getting the transcript. Uh, edited. And a couple of months ago, so we're recording this at the beginning of 2023, a couple of months ago, I was really taking a hard look at my time investment, exactly what you're saying, my time and investment and what I was getting back from it. I was making some money from patronage and uh, Patreon and buy me a coffee and all these kinds of things, but not enough to cover the, ex the total expense of my podcast production. And so I had to cut something out. And sort of the easiest thing to cut out that was going to give me the biggest bang for the buck was the transcript. And I had hesitated doing it for a long time because I would periodically hear from people saying, I'm not really a podcast listener, but I love reading the transcript. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And, you know, people would say, oh, this is much more like reading an article than it is like reading a transcript. So there was an audience out there for it. And in fact, I had, I had written up this whole script as kind of a, either a personal update or maybe a whole episode unto itself on the indie author about why I was doing this. And then I got to the point, I thought, you know what, no, I'm just going to stop doing it and see if anybody notices. And so on the place in the web page where in the past I would have put the transcript, I put a note saying, I am really sorry, but just the cost benefit of this I, was not something I could continue doing. If you're mm -hmm. here looking for the transcript, I would love to know that you're looking for it. So drop me a note. Um, and here's my email address and let me know that you've looked for the transcript. And since then, I've gotten one email, <laughs> one email from someone saying, I just wanted to let you know, I went on the web page and I said, you know, I'm complying with your request to let you know. So that turned out, I think, to be a good decision, both for me and for my listeners. Mm -hmm. But I'm also, and one of the reasons that I sort of felt better about doing that is that I think that people who are watching on YouTube, for example, can turn on YouTube generated captions mm -hmm. and they're, they're pretty good. And so the transcript actually fed the captions as well into scripts. So I was using it for both those purposes. And also the service just keeps getting better and better and better. And so I just started using the completely overhauled version of Descript called Storyboard. And I think that the transcription service has been improved as well, or at least the editing capabilities have been improved as well. So I'm experimenting again to see if, you know, if the time that I would need to do it now would justify, you know, the, the benefit to my listeners and to myself would that justify the extra time that I would be spending that hopefully wouldn't be as much as it used to be. So that would be my lesson to myself is I would rather have started simple without the transcript and eventually introduced the tra transcript and then stayed with it than have to withdraw something that, um, that I had accustomed people to getting. And so I have to ask you too, from a YouTube point of view, like what advice would you give to the 2016 MK? Oh man. Um, it's interesting because I am glad that 2016 MK didn't do any research because I think I would have seen all these other authors out there on YouTube talking about self-publishing. I would have been like, oh, I'll just send people to this person. Um, and I never would have started the YouTube channel. And I think that definitely would have been... I, I would be sad to not have it. I'd be sad to not have this community. And I think out of the YouTube channel and building the community there, I realized like, well, some people like to read, like to learn by reading books. Oh, I write books. I should, I should write books. And so the nonfiction side of my business, Author Your Ambition, has become such a big part of my business and such a fun part of, of my business, I would say, like actually getting to help authors. So I think if I if I was giving advice to anybody, I would say do your research, but also I'm glad I didn't do any research. <laughs> I just kind of went in blind. Um, but I think I, I'm glad I started small. I started with low expectations of just like, here you go, like, here's the answer you need. Um, I think I I would I wish I would have looked into how to optimize better first and like really had a better understanding of how do I make sure the people who are asking me questions find this. Maybe the people who don't even know me can find this. So I can truly just help more people. Um, I think I I was thinking too small. Like, let me just help the people who are literally just asking me one-off messages. Um, and so I wish I had looked a bit sooner and and learned how the algorithm worked sooner and to make use of if YouTube is letting you put in tags and keywords, you should probably be putting in tags and keywords, like just little things like that. But I also know that would have taken away from my other creative endeavors at the time. So it's hard. I And I also write like time travel fiction. So I know I don't like to mess with the timeline. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think my advice probably would have been to do a bit more research, if not on who else was out there and what they were doing, but to at least learn the platform. Um, I think one thing I am grateful for is that I had been watching enough other videos just for like travel random stuff. I, I was familiar with, there's a little intro, there's a little outro. Um, so I knew pretty early on to do those kind of hallmarks to make it look a bit more polished. Um, but I think if I had really done a deep dive into how to optimize um, and tell YouTube, this is what this video is about effectively, which I hadn't been doing, um, the channel might've grown that much sooner and who knows where that would have taken me. So um, yeah, learn, I think learn that the that platform. Yeah, that comment about there are a lot of other people YouTubing about self-publishing, you know, why do we really need another one is a great point. And it's exactly like 
not only there are a million other uh, podcasts out there <laughs> about writing and publishing, but also there are a lot of books about out there about whatever it is. And so I think mm -hmm. that for a lot of authors, that feeling that, um, well, you know, people have already written a lot of time travel books. I'm, you know, that area is all taken. No, you know, there's always the spin that, that the individual creator can put on it. And I really, this was illustrated really specifically to me. I was a guest on Kenny McKay's um, Author Your Dream podcast. And he was talking about how he, you know, we were talking about how we started our podcast. And he said that he wanted a podcast for um, for real beginners, uh, authors who haven't published their first book yet and are really looking for the basics information. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, there are a lot of um, popular podcasts that I listen to that I love, but they're for people at a more advanced stage of their career. And mm -hmm. that he specifically wanted one that was for the person who is looking to publish their first book. Mm -hmm. And same kind of thing. I think anybody who's looking to add an offering in a pool of a pool of offerings that seems like it might be full, they just have to bring their own spin to it and understand what group they want to niche down on. Like, are you mm -hmm. looking for the people who are looking to publish their first book? Or are you looking to the people who, you know, are now thinking of expanding into you know, they have a dozen books under their belt and they're looking to expand. So yeah, just finding that niche that you want to address, I think it's really important. Absolutely. And, and appreciating that there's different, was it different strokes for different folks? Like, um, you know, I could be saying the same exact thing that another person's saying, but the way I say it and the way that they connect with me, because maybe I look like them, maybe we're a similar age um, versus somebody else. Maybe that person like, oh, that reminds me of my dad or, oh, that person looks like me because I'm I'm an older male. You know, like that's, that's probably who they're going to resonate with. Yep. Um, and that's totally fine. That's normal. Um, we kind of look for um, the similarities or who do we feel comfortable taking advice from? Um, and just like there's people out there who are a bit more bombastic, like in your face, I'm a bit more like, Hey, yeah. Next. Um, and so I, I, I'm glad that I didn't look at that research because at the time I definitely would have been on the mindset of no, there, it's too full. It's too busy. I shouldn't be doing this. There's somebody else who can help. Um, whereas now on the other side, I see like, awesome. Like you're going to start a YouTube channel about authors too. That's awesome. Help them yeah. out. Like, how, how can I help you? I'm like, there's, there's, I've learned over years of publishing and of doing YouTube, like people will read more than one book in their life and people will watch more than one YouTube channel and people will listen to more than one podcast. Like it's fine. Be yeah, here. I think a really good example of that is um, the idea of uh, the books on publishing wide. And you have a book on publishing wide. Mm -hmm. Mark Lefebvre has a book on publishing wide. But I wouldn't read one and say, oh, now I don't need to read the other one because I've learned it all. Because I think the two of you bring very different perspectives to the topic. Mm -hmm. And so it's it should be like a bundle deal. You know, <laughs> Mark, could, I'm sure, would be happy to be promoting your book. And I know you're happy to promote Mark's book because they're kind of serving two different needs with two different personalities, two different points of view. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, you know, I, I think I shared with you, I started to write my book on Going Wide. Um, cause I was like, I'm getting a lot of questions specifically about, I'm ready to go off of Amazon. What do I do? What do I do with this title transfer with Ingram spark and all those really technical things. And I started to write it and I was about 12,000 words in when I saw this podcast pop up one day and it said wide for the win. I was like, God, oh, that sounds fun. And it was Mark Lefebvre announcing the book. And I was like, I don't think I should write this book anymore. Yeah. Um, and then I did actually get a chance to read it. So I was like, Oh, this is much more the philosophy of like why to go wide and like kind of that higher level. Whereas I was just down in the nitty gritty details and I was like, okay, well, we're good. We're good. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Um, and that is one thing I do appreciate about the indie author community is that we're all very welcoming um, yeah. and supportive of each other. And I think that's something that we find that you might find in other niches on YouTube or in podcasting where maybe that's not the case, but I think I think in our area, people are happy and nice to each other. And I, I like that. <laughs> well, I know you and I have a good sort of simpatico thing going because I would say for my offerings on the podcast and through my indie author YouTube channel and things like that, it is more mindset. It's like laying the foundation, kind of like, mm -hmm. uh, I won't say laying the foundation, but it's more like Mark's wide for the win in the sense of it being more the philosophy. And then whenever someone says, but now I want to load my book to KDP, I always send them to your YouTube channel because I think between the two of us, we have a nice spectrum of approaches covered. Yes. Yes. And I and I think maybe that goes to the difference between starting a podcast versus starting a YouTube, right? Like a lot of people go to YouTube of 
I broke the thing on my refrigerator. How do I fix it? They're literally yeah. looking for the how to in the moment. And I've kind of focused on that specifically of like, okay, how to upload to KDP. And I'm just literally screen yeah. capture showing people what to do, mentioning the things that might get glitchy. And that's hard to do with audio only, right? On a podcast. Yeah. Now, obviously a video podcast would be a little different, but you know, some of the audience is only listening, not watching. So I think maybe that speaks to the difference between, um, so for anybody looking to start a YouTube channel or a podcast, like how is the person experiencing that media? And I I think some of the bigger thoughts are sometimes better for podcasting because you're probably commuting or doing chores and you know, you're listening to the podcast, you're getting the big ideas. I think that that makes much more sense. Whereas then you're sitting down, I need this answer right now. Um, maybe YouTube works better for that. So yeah. Probably. Yeah. I have sort of capitalized on that. I made a, a virtue of a necessity because I totally agree. There would be topics that would come up and I would think, oh, I really want to talk about that on the podcast. But then just like you're saying, it would involve some visual aspect that I couldn't really accommodate. So I've started accommodating that by having the things that require a visual aspect being an extra for my patrons. And so there are special patron and podcast guest only events that I have. Like there's one coming up with Michael Iran on AI generated art. There's one coming up with Jennifer Hild about um, about uh, horror tropes, and that one isn't so visually oriented as it is interactive. You know, the intent is it for it to be an interactive. So when those things come up that don't lend themselves to a audio first approach, then mm -hmm. I'm using those as extras for my patrons, as thank yous to my patrons, um, to give them a little something extra. Yeah. And that that's smart. And I think that's something we've both started to, well, I know I've recently started to go, to go into this. I think you were, you were leveraging um, the patronage model before I was, um, but to actually say like, okay, if you want a little something extra um, here it is. And I think um, that took me a while to get comfortable with. And now I'm like, oh no, I love this. I love like the people who are my channel members. And we have this like live Q and A once a month and we get to chat and like keep each other accountable. I love it now. So um, that is exciting to have that model. Um, I think it's also a good, and this is, this is so much easier to say from the current, my current position than it would have been when I was starting out, but it is so much better to go into any of those kind of interactions, whether it's a YouTube channel or, um, where you're inter interacting with people on social media, for example, figuring that the goal is the interaction, not what you're going to get out of it. And so what I found is that when I was, trying to attract people to Patreon. And I was offering them membership in a private community as a thank you for doing that. Then it felt like a hard sell. But once I started getting a certain number of people in the community and we were having interactions, I was like, you know, even if nobody else ever signs up to be a member of the community, I'm still having a lot of fun. You know, this is a group of people I enjoy. We have nice conversations. It's uh, like targeted at a uh, since I'm the moderator, you know, I can steer it toward, do you want it to be more professionally oriented? Do you want it to be more personally oriented? Whatever that might be. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm enjoying it regardless. So that's kind of the golden place to be when you can have these things that you're offering to people as extra value, but you're just enjoying it anyway. So, you know, if you're enjoying the interactions you're having with your YouTube followers, then that's a payback that people shouldn't overlook. Absolutely. I think that it's so hard when we're trying to just quantify XYZ for the business, but there are some things like I always tell my husband after I have, you know, a, con a consulting call or my live QA call with the members, I'm like, I just got more energy from that than it took me to, to sit there and set it up. Um, so it always gives me more energy and I want to do more. And then he's like, okay, well, it's time to get our daughter up from her nap. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> that little detail. <laughs> so speaking of the the goal being the interaction i kind of want to talk about how you find good podcast guests and guests um to come on because i think so often authors when we are like okay i need to get on a podcast talk about my book the author's goal is to sell books <laughs> um but the the podcast host goal is the interaction so how do you find guests how do you kind of sort through who's going to be a great um guest on the podcast like how do you figure that out well, some I think that my most successful guests have been people that I either know personally, so I kind of know how they're going to be in a conversation. I feel comfortable setting the expectation with them that although I certainly 
understand their desire to sell something that can't, it can't be a sales pitch. It can't be an overt sales pitch or people that I've seen presenting, for example, at conferences, I've gotten a lot of guests from having gone to conferences and then asked the speakers at the conferences to be on the podcast. Um, I often get what feel like very generic pitches from authors or author publicists who say, you know, Jane Doe has her new book, Jane Doe's Guide to Something or Other, and she would love to come on your podcast and talk about it. And that's sort of irritating because one, it's clear that they've never listened to the podcast and they don't know that I interview authors specifically about their books. And for a while I wrote back and I tried to explain that. And after a while, I just thought, you know, if they're not taking the time to research the podcast, I'm going to take the time to explain why this isn't a good match. Um, Sometimes I'll get something like that that says, uh, so-and-so, you know, I just wrote a book about this. Um, I've listened to your podcast. I enjoyed this episode and I, I'd love to chat about my book with you. And sometimes I'm able to massage that into, well, I don't really talk about people's books because my, my standard is a listener has to be able to finish that and not just say, huh, interesting. They have to be able to say, oh, I got something from that, that I'm going to be able to apply to my own writing or publishing. And so maybe the person isn't even thinking of it that way, but I can say, you know what? I know you had a really interesting approach to your launch. Do you want to come in to talk about your launch? Or, you know, I know you and I are really book book cover design nerds. Do you want to come on the podcast and talk about book, n- book cover design nerdish stuff? And so um, those have been some very fun, um, fun conversations. When I'm assessing guests for the podcast, I it's always helpful for me to see video of them talking about the topic. And even if it's not video that is out there. Like if they have video from a class they gave or, you know, whatever it might be, other podcast interviews, even if it's just audio, that's great. But I've also had uh, one guest who didn't have any of that, but he recorded, he recorded a video specifically for me to illustrate that he was comfortable on video. He was comfortable talking about this topic. And I was like, you know what, you get extra credit because you want the extra mile to do that. And and I invited him onto the podcast. Um, I found that it's, A danger sign for me is when I'm approached by a publicist, not by the author themselves, because Mm -hmm. I think sometimes I've actually started asking the publicist, does your, does your client know that you're specifically pitching the author podcast? Mm -hmm. Because I don't want them to get up the morning of the interview, look at their calendar for the day and go, oh, I really don't want to do this. You know, I, I say, does your client specifically know? because mm-hmm. I don't want it to be disappointing for either one of us. Mm-hmm. And um, oh, another idea just uh, popped in and out of my mind. But I think that the key for people who are pitching podcasts is do not send a generic pitch. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're going to be asking a podcast host to spend an hour of their time interviewing you and probably an hour of their time researching you, then have the courtesy to spend 15 minutes listening to their podcast. <laughs> And the best podcasts to pitch are the ones you're listening to anyway, because they're by definition going to be appealing to your interest base. And you already know the host and their kind of style and that it's comfortable for you. Um, So yeah, that's kind of my checklist of things that I consider uh, when I'm considering guests. Absolutely. I am. As a side gig, after I left my full-time job, I was helping a major podcast with their publishing arm. And so as part of that, in my inbox, I would get all the the publicist random pitches for nothing related to their podcast. I mean, and I think that's one of the dangers of having a small business and being an author. I mean, we, we own a small business if we're, if we're an author, um, that some it's smaller than others, Um is saying, okay, well, let me outsource my PR. And and the value of a good publicist is the genuine connections that they have. And so I think a lot of these podcast pitching services, they don't have the genuine, genuine connection with the podcasts. They're almost blind pitching as well. And it's like, well, you, the author, could have done that and not shelled out money for this publishing pu- pu- publicist firm um, or, or podcast pitcher person. So um, I think that's always a good like buyer beware. Like if you're going to be paying somebody to help you with marketing and PR, like find out how they're operating, what their track record for success is um, and make sure that you're having those conversations to say, yeah, these are, these would be the dream podcast I would love to be on. These are other ones in the genre that I, I would love to be on. These are some I haven't even heard of, but you're saying that they're good. And you as my publicist have listened to them and have 
contacts with these people, great. Um, but I think a lot of them probably don't, and they're just kind of blind pitching. So yeah, I was went to a presentation uh, by Drew Ann Love and Christopher Zgorski about um, book blog tours or book bloggers in general. And somebody asked me about book blog tours and they said, beware of those that are clearly incented. They get paid by how many pitches they send out, <laughs> not how many they land. And so they're incented to just fire it off to as many people as, as they want to. And I think one thing that I'd also talk to my early Maddie Dowernbull fiction author self about is that I think there was a period of time when I thought, oh, if I had a publicist that would mark me as a professional and make me more appealing to these people. Mm -hmm. Whereas in fact, I, as a podcast host, consider it an extra barrier to overcome. Mm -hmm. And so if you need to use a publicist because you want to tap into their expertise and their contacts and you don't have the time to do it yourself, that's one thing. But if you're thinking about doing it because you think it'll make you look cooler, then I would advise you not to do that. Yeah, I agreed. Yeah, I, it was interesting. After I posted the first interview on my YouTube channel where I was like, oh, I think I could like interview somebody and do a longer form video. Most of my videos were very short and that was kind of the benefit, but I was like, I want to have a longer conversation. I just started to get so many pitches just randomly. And I was like, no, this doesn't, this isn't even related. Some of them called me dear sir. Like, yeah. Delete. Yeah. I got uh, pitched to be on the career author podcast. I mean, somebody pitched me okay. as the host quote, of the career author podcast, which was actually hosted by Jay Thorne and Zach Bohannon. And I wanted to write back and say, dude, like if you're gonna, if you're gonna do the search and replace, search and replace thoroughly, <laughs> don't send me a pitch for the wrong podcast. But yeah. the other thing I'll say is that it's worth investing the time to make an effective pitch to an individual person for those ones that are on your A-list because there are a number of guests and uh, your listeners, if there are any listeners of the Indie Author Podcast out there, they'll know who these people are, that they've been on over and over again. You're one of them mm -hmm. because I'll have a conversation with them. At the end of the conversation, they will have mentioned like one thing in passing. And I say, you know what? I would love to have a whole conversation with you about that thing. Can you come back in a couple of months? Or the conversation is just so compelling that I'm always on the lookout for other things to look for from them. And Honestly, if if I had to, I'd be perfectly happy just identifying the 12 rotating people who are going to be my guests on the Indie Author Podcast because they have something new to say every time. And they're always professional. They're prompt. They come prepared. I know it's going to be a great experience. And so if you can form that kind of relationship with a podcast host, then you're not necessarily just getting the one appearance. You might be getting multiple appearances. Yeah. And I, I think that's a good thing to focus that it's a genuine connection. I've seen some people do that the wrong way where they'll finish the podcast and then it'll go live and they'll say, okay, and here's five more things we can talk about next time. Let's schedule the next one. And I'm like, did you make a good connection? Yeah. It has to be yeah. that genuine connection. And again, it goes back to what you said before. It's like, you need to, the goal is the interaction. Yeah. Um, and, you know, because I have other friends who have more financial related podcasts and it seems similar to how you started. It was like, well, I just wanted a, an excuse to talk to these cool people that my, I might not otherwise have been able to talk to. But when I said I had a podcast, maybe that sound made me sound more interesting to talk to. Yeah. Um, you talk to my heroes, talk, talk to the titans in my industry. It's like, oh. You know, that yeah. the goal was clearly the interaction. Um, and I think that's always so, so critical. So, yeah. And I think that the other tip I would give people that's kind of, you know, we've been talking about getting the gig. But once you've gotten the gig and then you do the gig, there's a whole conversation we can have about that if you want to. But when you're done, you also have a responsibility to promote your appearance. And it surprises me how often, and this works both ways, it surprises me how often I've been a guest on a podcast and I don't realize that the episode is up until I happen upon it or somebody mentions it to me because the the host never let me know. And I thought, you're leaving a lot of opportunity on the table there because if I don't mm -hmm. know it's out there, I can't promote it. Mm -hmm. And then on the flip side, I also love the guests that I've had on multiple times because they're very diligent about sharing, liking, commenting, um, helping me promote it. And it's mm -hmm. not helping only to promote the indie author, it's helping to promote them too. And so promote, promote, promote is mm -hmm. another byword once you've uh, gotten the gig and your appearance is out there. Absolutely. And I, I think a lot of authors feel like, well, I don't have a big audience to share it to. Um, and it's kind of like, okay, well, let, let that audience know though. Like, you yeah. know, that's a way to show gratitude to 
the host for having you on the show. Even if you think that your handful of followers may not listen, it's like, okay, we'll still let them know. <laughs> um, yeah, because it's, it's I don't think I've ever, I've ever turned down a guest because they had a small number of like social media followers. If mm -hmm. I go to their social media page and they're active on it, and they seem to be sharing other people's stuff, whatever that is. I'm like, well, that's that's definitely a mark in their favor. And um, it makes me think of something you had said early on about uh, your your early videos, that even if you were initially only thinking of them as being for that particular person that had asked you the question, I feel certain that they were produced in a way that made them made that not apparent. Like you might as well start out as if you have an audience of thousands. Same kind of thing with your email newsletter. Like everybody starts out their email newsletter with two people, like your spouse and your mom. Mm -hmm. And But you should write those email newsletters, not like you're writing to your spouse and your mom, but like you're writing to a bunch of people who love your books. And if you start yeah. out that way, then it sets you up better later on. And also you won't be embarrassed if your later subscribers go back to those early ones and go, how come she's talking about like who's going to babysit on Sunday? Yeah, like P.S. We need <laughs> milk. To to mom. <laughs> yeah, and I, I agree, and I think that's something that I heard or read when I was starting um, to write and publish books is like understand where where you're starting. Right, you're starting small. There's obviously a lot of room group, but build in a way that makes it possible for you to have huge growth, for you to get that lightning in a bottle success. Like, what would you need to have in place? And sometimes it's like, well, okay, I don't need all of those things in place right now. But yeah, like, like you said, positioning yourself, whether it's in newsletters or podcasts or, or on a YouTube channel, as though lots of people will, will potentially see this. How can I appeal to that? Um, I will say the production value of my early videos was atrocious. <laughs> I did my best. It was the best I could do. Yeah. It was that. I'm a words creative. Well, also I've, technology I've has progressed. So, so yeah. Much yes. easier to do a professional thing today than it was even a couple of years ago. Yes. I would say also investing in a good webcam and a good microphone helped tremendously. Yeah. Well, you have such a, I need to get a like webcam advice because I'm just using the webcam on my, uh, on my MacBook Air and I know <laughs> it could be better. So I'll have to consult yeah, with you, you separately. Yeah. I'll send you the link for the one I use, or I guess if you, I don't know if you do, um, Amazon affiliates, but um, yep. I use a Logi, Logi HD 1080p. I have. Okay. A, I'll just send you the link. I'll just cool. <laughs> the link uh, in the show. For notes. anybody watching, I'll have the link below. Um, yeah. Cool. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Um, so I guess kind of to to wrap up everything about like podcasting, creating YouTube, doing the content marketing. Um, do. Do you think that this was like the right move for for the author business? Like if you if you could go back and say, no, it would have been better for me to write more books or it would have been better for me to do X, Y, or Z. Like, was this the right move for your author business um, to create it and continue it? I would never give up the podcast. I might have to give up component. Well, I won't say never, but I might give up components like the transcript, but I get so much enjoyment out of it you know, getting to talk to people, getting to talk to people about the topics that I'm interested in and um, getting to tap, you know, if I'm struggling with my social media presence, I get to call somebody up, somebody up who's a social media expert and say, hey, would you talk to me for 45 minutes about social media best practices? And I had gotten to talk to people I would never imagine had, I would have been able to talk to had it not been for the podcast, you know, authors that I have, that are, uh, you know, among my favorites. Um, that has been very exciting. And my attitude about the podcast from a, a business point of view <laughs> ebbs and flows because I was really getting sort of discouraged last year, you know, at the time when I was thinking I'm going to have to stop doing the transcripts. But then just at the end of, of uh, 2022, I got uh, several new Patreon supporters. So then I was feeling, oh, this is pretty good. I think you have to go into it knowing that for a long time, probably, unless you're going into it as a celebrity, you know, if you're already going into it with a huge following, then then this doesn't necessarily apply. But if you're going mm -hmm. in as an author who's trying to use podcasting to create a platform or, or earning or, I mean, uh, learning opportunity or paying it forward opportunity, then when you look at the hourly rate you're paying yourself, it's going to be minuscule. But you have to weigh all those other things we've been talking about as well. So I'm definitely happy I did it. 
I probably should have kept it more basic and therefore less expensive <laughs> uh, for longer into its life. And I don't think it, the results, the business results would have suffered as a result of having um, followed that approach. But um, yeah, it's not something I would give up. And of course, I have to ask you about your YouTube channel. Same question about your YouTube channel. Yes, I think it was definitely the right move business-wise. I think at the time I saw it as a, it'll save me free time. Maybe it'll make money. Not sure how the magic behind the scenes worked. Just assumed I, I should have been more pessimistic because obviously after self-publishing several books, I didn't just magically go viral. Um, should have realized that was probably going to be the case on YouTube, but it was definitely the right move for the business in that it it opened the door to more opportunities for me to write new and different books, for me to connect with people. Um, so I, I'm very glad that I did it, but I, I do say I I often want to caution people when they go in kind of with this idea of like, okay, and then I'll just make money doing that. And I'm like, mm -hmm, it takes a lot of time. Yeah. Don't, don't plan on being the viral success. Don't plan on being lightning in a bottle. You really have to enjoy it for the sake of creating the videos, talking with people, engaging with people, um, because otherwise you're just going to burn out on it so fast. And then, oh, at the same time, you weren't writing your books. Um, and so for authors, that there's such a precious balance of the, the free time that we have between, well, do I market the book or do I write the next book? Do I build my platform or do I write the next book? Um, and I would say nine times out of 10, I tell people, write your next book. Like, don't yeah. don't go crazy trying to to do the next thing unless you're really all in on it. And I've even in the past year scaled back some of my social media um, uses for for lots of different reasons. But really, like this year, I'm mostly all in on YouTube, and a little bit posting on Instagram. I'm still trying to figure out TikTok, so it's kind of like a did I think of something cute and funny I could post on TikTok today? Nope. Okay, not gonna post. Um, yeah. And things like that, just to really say I'm gonna show up on the platform I'm the most comfortable with and where I, I want to grow my audience the most and that, that this year is going to be YouTube. Um, yeah. And just kind of going all in on that. I think, I think if I had realized I should go all in on it sooner, that probably would have been better, but I'm, I'm happy well, like, to have it. I think it makes sense like a generalizable lesson for authors, whether they want to do a podcast or YouTube channel or not is exactly that thing about aligning your, aligning your expectations with where you are in your career, mm -hmm. but also not undervaluing what you've achieved. I was talking with an author the other day who's um, on Substack and he has, he said, I only have 40 followers. I was like, it's 40 followers. Like it makes me sad whenever I hear someone say, I have this platform, mm -hmm. but I only have fill in the blank numbers. And sometimes it's, I only have 10 or I only have a thousand or, you know, it's just comparison. I just gone crazy. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, so make sure your expectations are realistic and celebrate when you're making progress, not bait yourself up for not making progress faster. Um, but, and I think the other thing that applies is make sure you're going at it with a professional point of view from the beginning. Like don't put out your first book with a PowerPoint cover because only mom's going to read it. Well, that only works if if you plan only to have your mom read all the rest of your books, like, no, you have to treat it like the professional endeavor that it is. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Setting it up for, for that mega success should yeah. it come knocking at your door. You never know. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Awesome. Well, this has been super fun to chat. Um, and I, I always love, I always look forward to our talks because they, they always take us fun places. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm super excited to have this conversation. Um, and I'll give you a chance to talk about, um, podcasting for authors, because this is an amazing book and now coaching that you're doing. So if people are interested, they can hear more from you. Yeah, that would be great. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. And, uh, if people want to hear more about my fiction, they can check that out at maddiedalrymple.com and that's Maddie with a Y. M-A-T-T-Y. Um, but if they want to learn more about my nonfiction platform, the Indie Author, which is Indie with a Y, I-N-D-Y, they can go to theindieauthor.com. And I do have, do I have it here? Here's podcasting for authors. So I decided that I, I got a lot of questions, like you were saying for YouTube channel, I got a lot of questions about podcasting. So I decided to capture those in the Indie Author's Guide to Podcasting for Authors, which is also available as AI generated audio on my PayHip store payhip.com forward slash Maddie Dalrymple and on Google Play, I believe. That's right. And um, I am also offering a podcasting for authors consulting service. So if they go to theindieauthor.com forward slash services, they can find more information about that. 
Awesome. Awesome. Well, I'm sure some people who are watching this are probably interested in starting a podcast. So hopefully they will be able to check that out and talk with you more to get that started. That would be great. Thank you so much. I'm Kay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Maddie, for being on the channel. It was so great to chat with you. And as always, we ended up just chatting and rambling a bit afterwards. Um, so I'm really excited to always bring her thoughts and insights to you guys because um, she does have so much great information and experience. Um, and she's actually going to be releasing this audio on her podcast as well today. So definitely check out the Indie Author podcast and you'll definitely find some gems in there. Um, whatever you are writing or wherever you're kind of blocked writing, I guarantee she has an episode for you. She's talked with so many great people in the indie author community um, and different experts in their field. So definitely check that out and check out Podcasting for Authors, her book that can help you if you're thinking about starting a podcast and maybe even connect directly with Maddie because she knows her stuff and she can definitely help you get started if that's what you're looking to do. If you found this interview helpful, informative, entertaining, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up, hit subscribe, and maybe even hit that new thanks button. That lets YouTube know that you're getting value from this information, and then they can put it in front of other authors like us. Now you can get back to writing your book.